Good afternoon and welcome to the Orkney International Science Festival. My name is Heather Woodbridge and I have the pleasure of hosting this session from North Ronaldsay in Orkney. The Orkney International Science Festival is entering its 30th anniversary year this year and we are marking this occasion with the very first online festival. This year, we are delighted to bring a full festival programme directly to you wherever you are at this moment. Today, I'm joined by three speakers. Um, I'm joined by Shan Tarrant, also in North Ronaldsy today. Um, Dr. Ian Lambert joining us from Detroit, USA, and Dr. Katerina Bones joining us from Dundee. So hello and welcome. Hello. 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 So I'll just introduce our fantastic speakers this afternoon. So Shan Tarrant is the Sheep Dyke ward Warden in North Ronaldsay, repairing the uh, Grade A lifted structure when it's damaged by winter storms. She studied marine biology at the University of St Andrews for her undergraduate degree. She then went on to work for the Sea Mammal Research Unit at the British Antarctic Survey. Alongside her role as Sheep Dyke Warden, she is currently studying wildlife and conservation management at a postgraduate level and will research the use of North Ronaldsay sheep in conservation grazing. So welcome, Shan. Dr. Ian Lambert is the Dean of Graduate Studies at the College for Creative Studies in Detroit, USA, where he's joining from, uh, from today. Prior to this, he worked at Edinburgh Napier University in Scotland for almost 20 years. He is a designer, maker, and researcher, and has published widely on making his knowledge, sustainability, and designing with ocean plastic. He was co-chair of the Research Through Design Conference in 2017 and will be co-chairing the Cumulus Conference in Detroit 2022. And finally, last but not least, Dr. Katharina Bones. Dr. Katharina Bones is a lecturer in jewellery and metal design at the University of Dundee, trained also at the University of St Andrews in 2001, the Edinburgh College of Art 2006, the Royal College of Art 2010 and the University of Dundee 2017. Her research focuses on sustainable craft practice centered on novel materiality and how jewellery design possesses biomimetic characteristics which can be brought to life through the use of smart materials. Katerina actively blogs about this practice as a way to encourage craft practitioners to participate in open and sustainable communi communities of making. And you can find more information at www.smart-jewellery.com. So, Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And before we get on to our fantastic presentation we've got lined up, if you have any questions for any of our speakers this afternoon, please enter them into the YouTube live chat. And what we'll do is we'll come back to these at the end of the talk. Well, I hope you enjoy Shan, Ian and Katerina's talk this afternoon. And I think I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Heather. Um, so I actually prepared a, uh, a short film uh, for today, but unfortunately we can't show it through through this link because um, I think Zoom is having some problems with the connection showing videos. And um, so I'm going to pop it in the the chat box, which is on the side of um, of this one here, and hopefully you'll have a chance to to view it. So this, um, the video that I prepared is looking at resources on the shore and it's focusing on the North Ronaldsay sheep which live on the shore and they are bred and used for their meat but also for their yarn which I'm going to focus on um, in, in this talk and in the video. So the video uh, will follow the story um, of the sheep from the shore uh, to how they are rounded up um, into sewn enclosures which are called puns and they are sheared in August, and then it will follow the wool um, from those shearings uh, to where it's processed to the mill, which is, is on the island, and it's processed into yarn. Could I have the next slide, please? So the Nofronesi sheep are a primitive breed. They're quite small, about 25 kilos, so much smaller than the sheep you'd see um, you know, down south, big white sheep in the field. Um, they're from the same northern short-tail group um, of sheep, um, so the same sheep that you'd find which are indigenous to St Kilda, Iceland and Norway. 
they've been uh, on the island probably for around 5,000 years and they're very similar to the remains that we find um, all over Orkney from of sheep um, in, in prehistoric vill villages. Um, and the remains from these sheep also show that they, for as long as they've been on Orkney, which is around 5,000 years, they've, they've eaten seaweed for, for that long as well. So the sheep on North Wallaby, um were all over the island until 1832 when a dry stone wall was built uh, around the island. So it's 12 miles long and it goes around the circumference of the island and the sheep are kept on the beach. So the sheep uh, adapted to their new environment and diet by eating seaweed. So tons of kelp, which are known locally as tangles or wear, are ripped from the seabed moorings um, between us and Sandy, and they are washed up on the beaches by the winter storms. And this is what the sheep feed on. The sheep are managed um, by sheep farmers on the island, but the, the management is overseen by something called a sheep court, which is um, a group of the sheep farmers and other islanders, and they are responsible for managing the grazing, deciding which bits of the dike need to be rebuilt and counting the sheep on the shore. So as I mentioned earlier, the sheep rounded up um, into stone enclosures called puns. And in August, um, they are punded to, for shearing. So the, the sheep are shorn in August and then the wool goes uh, from the puns to the mill where it is processed. Next slide, please. So the mill on North Wanadu, in my opinion, is huge, hugely underappreciated. So few places um, around the UK and I suppose around the world are actually able to process their own wool. So it's a unique, a unique selling point um, that the wool from these sheep can be made into lovely soft yarn right here on the island. There are a lot of processes that have to happen um, under the right conditions before you end up with a skein of yarn. And it was a privilege getting to spend time with Helen who works in the mill to be able to look at each of these processes in depth. You'll see in the film um, the way that the, the wool is sorted. So because the sheep have a double coated fleece, they contain really soft wool fibers, which you want in the yarn, but they also contain much shorter and coarser hair fibers, which you want to take out of the yarn um, because it will shed and it's, it's quite um, bristly. So um, you'll see the wool being processed and the hair being taken out of the yarn and then the wool being processed into the, um, into the soft yarns. North one of these sheep um, don't just come in white, they come in all kinds of colours. So it's great to be able to um, separate the wool uh, into, into the different colours so you end up with different coloured yarns. Um, I was also lucky enough to be able to see what Helen does at home um, with some of the yarn from the mill, which is to weave it into textiles. It's an absolutely amazing um, and a mesmerizing process to, to watch and really quite therapeutic. And it's great to be able to follow the sheep from the shore to the wall in the mill and then being able to see it being woven into textile all by hand. Next slide, please. So North Ronaldsea has an Iron Age brock, which is called the Brock of Burian. And this is where uh, 2000 year old weaving combs made from the bones of marine, marine mammals have been found. But the sheep have been on Orkney uh, for much longer than that, as I mentioned. And their wool during that time would have been a treasured, re treasured resource um, on such an exposed uh, set of islands, providing warmth and protection from the elements. Um, in the last uh, maybe 40, 30 years or so, uh, wool has been sort of um, ditched and we're using more cheap uh, synthetics to make our textiles um, but I think as we're becoming more environmentally conscious as a society again um, I hope that the wool, the wool can be valued as much as it once was. Uh, next slide please. So wool is an amazing uh, and complex natural fibre and it can be used in a lot of different products from carpets and bedding and furnishings and clothing. So, it's a really sustainable uh, fibre because the sheep regrow their fleece every year. So it's a natural process and part of the carbon cycle. And it's only requiring the inputs of sunshine, rain and grass, or in the case of North Ormond Sea, they're eating seaweed. And seaweed is actually one of the fastest growing 
organisms uh, on the planet, it grows uh, four times faster than grass, so it replenishes much quicker. So by this, the sheep eating the seaweed, um, they're eating a resource which is replenishing much more quickly than they, if they were on grass. So wool production um, does contribute to greenhouse gas emissions because keeping sheep, um, they produce quite a bit of methane. However, um, in the last year or so, we've had um, stuff in the news and recent research has shown that uh, the methane production is vastly reduced by livestock eating seaweed, which is a plus for authority because they naturally occur eating seaweed, whereas um, cattle and other livestock farmers are looking into seaweed enrichment in, in cattle feeds. Sheep farming often results in degraded soils, but healthy soils are a huge carbon sink. So um, degraded soils absorb less carbon. However, the sheep on the aren't don't have a lot of access to, um, to soils because they're kept on the rocky shore, making them a much more um, eco-friendly option. Another problem with um, synthetic fibres is that they produce a lot of microplastics in the marine environment, which I'm sure um, Ian and Katerina will talk on in a bit. Um, but by contrast, wool is ready, readily biodegrades in both land and marine environments. So it's not contributing to the microplastic pollution. Wool can decompose into soil in a matter of months, but if you compost it in the right temperatures, it can actually release nutrients back into the earth in a really, really quick turnaround. If we're wearing woolen garments, they're often uh, washed much less often due to their odour and stain resistant properties. And they're often washed at much less temperatures, because if you wash wool at a high temperature, then you end up with a much smaller garment than when you started with. Wool is also dried naturally because of this problem. So you don't have people using um, tumble dryers when they're washing woolen garments and drying them. Over their lifetime, woolen garments require less inputs of water, energy and detergents than, synth than synthetic garments. As I mentioned, it's also recyclable um, by composting, but you can also, if you had a holy jumper, you could rip the yarn apart and reprocess the yarn and then knit that into something new. So it is in fact one of nature's only truly sustainable textiles. Okay, well, I hope you get a chance to watch the film um, and I'll pass you on now to Ian and Katerina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, so um, thank you all for coming today. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, my name is uh, Ian Lambert and um, with me is Kathy Bones. Uh, we've we've no. worked together. So um, here we are uh, on a remote shore on the west coast of Scotland undertaking the research. Kathy will take over the presentation halfway through. So if you could go to the next slide, what we're going to talk about is ocean plastic. Um, this image here is, is, is been widely publicized now. Um, many of you will be aware that, that uh, there's a lot of plastic going into the ocean. Uh, some estimates um, say 8 million tons. Um, some say up to 12 million tons, although there's no real way of knowing how much is going in. These are, these are estimates, uh, educated guesses, I suppose. Um, and it's contributing to um, uh, plastic waste around the, the, the world's shorelines, but also there are uh, known to be five enormous gyres. Um, the, the, the first one that was discovered in the North Pacific was, is, is commonly known as the Pacific Garbage Patch. And it's this vast area of floating plastic um, around about the size of uh, Australia. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and um, it's, it's not so much something that you can see so clearly from, the surf, uh, from, from above the surface, but underneath the surface where the plastic is floating just below the water, um, you will see a, the, the, a, sim a picture similar to the, to the one on the right um, with vast amounts of plastic waste that have been washed out uh, into the sea from the world's rivers and other sources of, of maritime waste. Um, and the effect of ocean plastic on wildlife is also very well publicized. You may have seen these rather shocking images of seabirds uh, who are starved to death because their stomachs have become full of plastic that they've mistaken for food. Similarly with, with whales and other cetaceans as well. Um, next slide, please. So the, the research, um, our interest in ocean plastic started about five or six years ago um, and became more 
publicized thanks, thanks to David Attenborough's The Blue Planet. But we started researching um, in the Outer Hebrides, actually on this tiny island, uh, Scarp, um, which is just off the west coast of the Isle of Harris. Um, and with the prevailing currents, the, the Outer Hebrides kind of act as a, as a comb for ocean plastic, and a lot of plastic collects on the west coast. Um, in Scarp itself, um, the research really started with an interest in the material culture of the island. Um, the, the, uh, the last inhabitants of Scarp left the island in the early 1970s, moving to the, the larger island. Um, and historically, on this treeless island, uh, the locals would go to the, a beach on the west side called the Mole Moor and collect um, timber. Uh, timber might, might maybe be used for firewood, although they did burn peat. It was also used for construction and repairs, for building furniture, for building coffins. Um, and there was quite a reliable source of this timber that was just brought to the beach from around the world. Um, today, that has been replaced largely with plastic. So um, when we went there to visit, we, we, we saw some fairly shocking images. Next slide, please. Um, this, is a, this is a really beautiful part of the world. The, the, the sea is as blue as, as it would be in the Caribbean. The beaches are beautiful and sandy. Um, this is us walking up the hill to get from, from the, the old uh, the village to the Mole Moor. The village now is inhabited only in the summer by holiday makers. The cottages of some of the cottages there have now been converted into holiday homes. So there's about a 40 minute um, scramble over the hill to the Mole Moor. Next slide, please. And as you wander down to the other side of the hill, you see this beautiful beach looking out into the North Atlantic. Um, and uh, somewhere in the distance, you may be able to spot on a clear day St Kilda. Um, if you go down, next slide, please. But when you arrive on the uh, beach, um, you're confronted with this image. And it's, it was quite a shock. Uh, when I first stepped onto the beach and saw this, I, I was on my own, in fact. Um, and a lot of expletives were coming out of my mouth at, at, at this very site. It was quite shocking to see this, this large amount of plastic. Now, in a, it, this is a very remote island, so if it had been a beach in a, in a heavily inhabited area with lots of visitors, then people would, would clear this stuff up. People pick up plastic as they, as they go to the beaches. Very few people come to this beach. Um, we interviewed some of the people that, that holiday on the island. They own the cottage there. They've been holiday, holiday, holidaying there for about 30 years. And they made this fascinating observation that um, since the early 19, uh, 1990s, the variety of objects uh, decreased. In the early 80s, they would find a, a far wider variety of things washing up on the beach. And they've linked this with um, this decline uh, with New York um, uh, no longer dumping their rubbish in the sea, which they stopped doing, I think, in 1994. And from that point onwards, the number of objects dimin diminished, which is good news, of course. But for these islanders, they would often treat this beach as a, as a kind of a, a local hardware store. Um, they could reliably go down to, the, to this beach and find objects that they need, the pipe for irrigating um, their, their vegetable patches, pipes for repair work, materials for repair work on the, on the, on the cottages. Um, and in many respects, when I, when I asked about um, clearing up the beach, they were quite horrified at the idea that this great resource that they would use would be taken away from them. And they were using the beach for, for these resources very much like um, uh, uh, people would do um, it historically going down to the beach to find their, their materials. So um, the next slide, please. As you will see, um, a lot of this waste is washed up all um, along the beach, but um, a lot of the plastic there comes from the maritime industry. Um, uh, when we speak to locals, they often point the finger of blame at the fish farms. Um, a lot of this stuff has clearly come off trawlers. There, there are thousands of the trawler floats, the, bit, the large round floats that you see are trawler floats for holding trawler nets. Um, there are vast amounts of plastic here on this beach, and it's been there for a very long time. Next slide, please. Um, you know, and, and the, of all, of every plastic type is here. Every, every polymer type you can imagine is probably here on this beach. Next slide. And you can see also these larger objects are, are only really, uh, uh, this is what we see, this is the stuff that shocks us, but the, this is stuff that's actually easier to clear away. And as you can see here, the stuff is now starting to uh, integrate into the rocks. Uh, next slide. Um, 
uh, in other parts of Harris as well, we, we, uh, we looked around, we went down to, to the beach at Rodal. So next slide, please. And here uh, you can see where the plastic is, is really integrating into the shoreline, integrating into the, into the earth, um, into the environment. Next slide, please. And this stuff is much harder to retrieve, these small fragments of rope, polypropylene rope. Um, this great variety of objects that have come from, from ships. Next slide, please. Uh, fishing nets are in abundance. Now, some of these may get picked up by locals um, who will use them and actually uh, use this to stop soil erosion around uh, in, in driveways or on roads. They, they'll get reclaimed and reused. Next slide. And the next slide, please. And here you can really see how, how nature is claiming these objects back into, into, the, into the ground. Um, the, we, we, we have no real way of knowing how long this plastic has been here. But part of the problem with the ocean plastic is, um, is what to do with it. Um, so collecting it from the beaches may seem like an obvious thing, but then what do you do with it? We've got to take it from Harris back to the mainland. Um, it's difficult to recycle because it spends a lot of time in the ocean, uh, exposed to sunlight, so it photodegenerates, which changes the structure of the plastic. Um, it also attracts a lot of microorganisms, which Kathy is going to talk about in a moment. Um, it brings on salt water, so it gets heavily contaminated, which makes it difficult to put back into the, into the manufacturing cycle. Um, some companies, um, Ecova, for example, have tried to integrate small amounts of ocean plastic, uh, mixing it with um, either plastic that's been recycled from, from uh, normal domestic um, sources uh, or from, with virgin plastics. So small amounts of it can go back in there, but it does contaminate. Um, next slide, please. But I think uh, what Ian mentioned there about the, um, the, the objects getting subsumed by the soil, that is a ma major problem uh, is on these islands. And you can see that here, the ropes, uh, these, these are ro this is a bundle of ropes that's been uh, completely overtaken by, uh, overgrown by moss. Um, and it, there's no way to get that out, to, to gather, to do anything with it. That is fused into the soil now. And we found that quite a lot on, on many different beaches that we went to. Yeah. So, um, and uh, there was one case where um, we, there, there'd been a rainstorm the night before that had washed away the sides of a, of a stream. Um, and you could see the strata of plastic that had uh, collected over the years. So it's been around for a very long time. And, and as Kathy says, it's almost impossible to collect these small items. Now, some estimates in some of the research papers that we've been looking at uh, suggest that, and again, there's no way of knowing this, but suggest that because the plastic becomes very brittle in the ocean, it fragments, um, becomes very brittle and it uh, fragments into uh, particles um, smaller than a millimeter. And they, they, they believe that up to 60% of the plastic in the oceans um, are in these micro particles, which again makes it very difficult uh, for us to retrieve. And it's now entering in the food chain. Next slide, please. And here again, another example of how, how nature is pulling this, um, uh, pulling this plastic back into the land. These are quite shocking images. Next slide. So also, um, we went around to some of these sea locks. They're, they're only accessible um, by boat, or you know, if you want to walk there, it'll take you about eight hours from the road. But we got there with some, some, with some local help. Um, we were taken around these, these, uh, these locks, and you can see, uh, again, more of the plastic that's washed up in, in these areas. Next slide. Uh, and again, all along the shoreline. These are quite inaccessible places. It's very difficult to even land here and collect some of this plastic. Next slide, please. And here is the, the, the river bank that we were talking about where it had been washed away. And you can see how the plastic goes down into the layers of soil and the rock. Um, and that's been there for many, many years. Next slide. And again, um, this great variety of things. It sort of points to um, a slightly perverse kind of form of global um, of, 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 of globalization, um, the way that a lot of this plastic has been brought to the island through the currents of, of, the, of the sea, um, in the same way that commodities were brought to the islands um, that people used to use historically. But here, some of this waste can be, can be reused and reappropriated, um, but much of it is unwanted waste, and it's very difficult to collect here in this remote place. But it, it kind of represents this sort of, um, uh, with these objects, this story of industrialization around the world and, and global trade 
Um, so a lot of this stuff has been swept off ships. It's come from maritime industries, as I said before, but it's not only maritime industries. Um, it's, it's come from all sorts of, uh, all sorts of trade. So um, over to Cathy uh, for the next slide, please. Thank you, Ian. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, basically, our, when we were on the island, we, we photographed the plastic, we interviewed the locals um, about the plastic, and we also picked up a good variety of samples. Um, now, I think this is probably still true, but if you pick up uh, a piece of rubbish and then you discard it again, it is your responsibility. So we didn't take a lot of samples. We took maybe two two, three big plastic bags with us to the lab. Um, and uh, we were fortunate enough to have the help of a material scientist to analyze these samples in the Edinburgh Napier University Polymer Lab and um, using an infrared spectrometer and differential scanning calorimeter, just to kind of get an, a feeling how decayed is this plastic? Um, what types of plastic did we bring back? Um, and sometimes we were even to, able to pinpoint manufacturers or at least an approximation of these manufacturers. So that was very interesting. Um, I also um, photographed each sample and you can see one of these images here. This is a brush-like object we picked up in a I think you saw that the, the whole object in, in one of the earlier slides, um, which is made from PP, it's about 15 centimeters. I would say that's uh, sort of the average size of fragments that we picked up. Um, you can see quite clearly how dirty the plastic is when it is retrieved from the beach. You can see um, marine life is starting to grow and it. nature is starting to take over. And um, for us, a big part of our project, what, what, can, what can we do with this plastic? How can we make this material resource um, accessible to people? For instance, makers, um, we are quite interested in the Men in Shades movement. Um, and at that point, um, I had just started experimenting with filament extrusion um, and I've, I've heard since that some of you on um, Orkney are also do, have set up a group to do this so I'm quite happy to talk to you about this process a little bit more um, and that was certainly one of the intentions of the project to see if this this plastic could be re-extruded into 3D printing filament uh, next slide please um, a lot of my work focuses on the macroscopic, so I have quite a keen interest in macroscopic um, photography and I thought uh, let's see what we can see when we put these samples under a microscope. And uh, you can see here, that's the um, a photograph of the previous item, the sort of brush-like object, um, but under a magnification of three. So um, you can see what Ian was saying earlier about parts splintering off, um, little just little scales coming off. You can see how dirty it is. And, and that sort of dirt that gets trapped under these rough surface scales is actually very, very hard to remove. Next slide, please. You can also see between the bristles, the sand, the, the soil, the, the salt gets caught. And again, that, that would take a very long time to remove that. Uh, next slide, please. That we took so many different types of materials. This is um, a piece, again, I think it's PP from a bigger crate. Uh, you can see here how it has photo degenerated, how even this sample is uh, starting to break up into smaller pieces. It's become very brittle. It's become very hard to handle. Next slide. And um, you can see again the scales of uh, on the surface of that, and and each scale, uh, as soon as the near next storm hits, I'm sure you're very familiar with those um, up up on the islands. Uh, in from September onwards, the plastic gets roughed around the rocks, it gets um, pushed about, and all the scales start being pushed off the off the plastic, never to be seen again, and and penetrating the the hot, you know the, the the water table. And of course, since we've done this research a lot of that has emerged as being quite accurate and uh, microplastics now appearing in very, very remote um, bodies of water. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is another very interesting sample. So it it's probably some sort of mechanism, some sort of door that's uh, used in the fishing industry. Um, it's made of HDPE. Next slide. And that seems to carry um, quite particular um, uh, problematic with it. So unlike the other two samples, this one had quite a lot of um, algal growth on it. So you can see uh, the rough surface actually encourages these organisms to settle in the cracks and to form a tight network of roots on there. 
um, that of course also starts to kind of uh, raise questions of species migration. Some of the samples we found had traveled from as far as Spain uh, and we heard from locals that they in the past they had found um, things, uh, seeds, big seeds from the Amazon called mermaid's tears. So, so this could be, this could be coming from anywhere and um, who knows what organism might hitch a ride on that. Uh, next slide, please. And then some of the larger samples just had a sort of normal sand contamination. But if you look um, a bit closer at the sample, um, next slide, please. You can see again, and the sand is actually trapped underneath the, the network of, um, of roots of, of the algae. So again, that would be very, very hard to, to remove. And of course, when you're starting to, to, pr to process these plastic samples, you need to make sure that as much of the surface dirt has been removed as possible. Um, that in itself, you know, you, we had a research assistant who then scrubbed the plastic really hard with a very stiff brush, bristle brush on the running water. But that, of course, then raises questions about whether that is the best use of clean water. Um, and, and so sustainability can be quite a complex topic to, to think about. Um, next slide, please. So once uh, this is one of the boy, you saw there's a lot of boys on those beaches. And um, as Ian said, some of these can be reused. This particular one is sadly a little bit broken. They're very solid. They're very thick walled. They, um, and they're very hard to do anything with really other than, um, than reuse them or use them as decorative objects. And not least because the polystyrene plastic they're made from is one of the harder plastics to, to recycle and reuse. Um, next slide, please. This was one of the beaches we went to near Schillebost, I think. Uh, and uh, you can see that sometimes some of the beaches on Harris actually look completely pristine. You would never think um, that this is the same island that you saw in the earlier pictures. Um, and that has a lot to do with the way the currents wash the plastic up. And I've, I've noticed this certainly living uh, in Dundee. Uh, the beaches here don't seem to have the same problem. Whereas if you go on the other side, we also visited the town of Malay, um, then you have you have the, the plastic problem again. So a, a lot of this problem um, is, is about geography at the end of the day um, and the currents coming in a certain direction. Uh, next slide, please. So after we'd been uh, we'd been processing the uh, plastic in the lab, we we washed it, we dried it very thoroughly. Plastic needs to be very clean and very dry before it can be extruded into three D printing filament, um, and then we extruded it through a large um, a large industrial scale extruder in the lab into um, beautiful rolls of um, 1.75 millimeter um, 3D printing filament. And we particularly focused on the HDPE and the PP. These are two plastics that are already being used for um, 3D printing and and they work very well on, on all kinds of 3D printers, especially the ones you can use at home. Um, and I've actually got one of the rolls here. I don't know if you're able to see that. Um, it's it's turned it's it's a very nice color. We were very surprised. The colors turned out. They became very bright. Uh, it's very attractive uh, filament. Um, we had to add some virgin plastic without that. The filament won't extrude correctly. So um, especially as the, the 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 quality of the ocean plastic um, granulate that we generated is already pretty deteriorated. So um, you do have to add some virgin plastic to the mix to make it viable. Um, but um, we tried as much uh, as possible to keep that percentage down and in the end we managed to get it down to about 50 60 percent that was um, probably the limit um, the, the filament has some interesting characteristics um, the filament after shredding it it gets extruded through a very high um, sorry shall I show that again I'll just um, I'll just leave it here uh, through a high temperature nozzle at around 200 degrees Celsius. And you would think that it completely sterilizes anything that might still be in there. And of course, 
there were some microorganisms surviving inside the even very washed and cleaned and dried um, granulates. So when you actually, sadly, obviously, this is not something you can do online, but when you actually hold this up to your nose, you can still smell that sort of algal smell from the sea. And I, I really like that. I think uh, it's a very particular characteristic of this material and it speaks of its origins. Um, but and it's, again, this might be something quite difficult to see. There are actually also still um, little speckles of sand. You can just see them, just tiny little grains of sand. Um, but they don't actually influence the um, printing process at all, um, because especially when you're printing with a slightly larger diameter nozzle. Um, and another part of the project was we wanted to educate the local school children a little bit about the problem that was on their doorstep and uh, and and maybe inspire them to to attempt themselves to solve this problem to emulate the process that we had been trialing um, and you can see here uh, we went into um, the local high school in um, Tarbet and you can see here a class we taught um, with uh, we, we generated a map of the island. You can just see that in the bottom corner there. And then we took 3D printing pens and we encouraged uh, the, the pupils to, to draw, to make little objects and with the filament and then to look at, um, choose a beach that they were maybe quite attached to or where they lived. Um, next slide, please. Um, and just really engage with the material. Uh, here, this is actually the high school in Malik we went to uh, that I mentioned earlier. And you can see that in the background, um, the filament extruder. So we brought the process to the classroom. We extruded some filament with them and then we printed out the piece of the landscape that they had chosen as a, as a place with some meaning to them. Um, next slide, please. Um, with the extruded filament and you can just see the those the results of that here so I think that was quite interesting for the children to learn about how is plastic made where is it coming from um, we showed them of course what we had found on uh, in their environment and brought some parts of the ocean plastic with us uh, next slide please and that's the final final outcomes and and each child got to take home one of these tiles and could hopefully remember in the future yes this this is what i could potentially do with this kind of plastic that we found on the shore uh, next slide please we also um, taught this workshop at the Research Through Design Conference in Delft uh, with um, fellow research, um, with a fellow research audience. And you can see here we're in their make space. Um, I'm not sure if all of you know what a make space is, but it's basically a place where people um, can engage with digital making. Um, and this particular make space luckily had a granulator, which is the machine you can just see on the right here, the, the big blue machine. Uh, and we granulated a few pieces of plastic that we brought with us. They were maybe still a little bit damp. So you can see the filament that we extruded from them um, on the right is a little bit um, grainier than maybe the filament that we produced in the lab. But it was really interesting to see that this process can work with the kind of equipment that we, you could reasonably expect maybe a school to have or a university or an average maker space. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then participants um, of this workshop were sort of encouraged to think about the problem, what it meant to them. And they came up with the 26.8 kilo ring, um, which is based on the calculation of at the time, how much plastic you would each person would have to pick up to alleviate the plastic pollution um, that is estimated to be in the ocean. Um, so we came up with the figure 26.8 kilos. And uh, these rings uh, were printed in situ right there uh, with the filament we'd made from ocean plastics. So that was really nice, a really nice souvenir from the workshop and hopefully a great reminder of um, what, what is the, you know, the importance of this issue. Uh, next slide, please. And that's it really. Um, we just wanted to, to, memory, uh, to, to remember our lovely guy, Donald, John McInnes. Ian, maybe if you want to say something there as well. Yeah, I mean, just just to say, we wanted to acknowledge um, Donald. He was one of the uh, he was born on Scarp, um, yeah. and he's one of the people that that gave us a lot of help um, this time. And tragically, he died this year, actually rounding up sheep um, yeah. on the island. Um, so we just wanted to remember him. 
and and having trekked around that island i can i can definitely say it's a it's a tough trek so um hats off to john uh, donald and that's it thank you very much for listening to our, our our talk and if there are any questions we're very happy to answer them now excellent thank you very much that was absolutely fascinating oh, shan are you are you still there shan uh, oh, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Well, thank you very much to all of our speakers, Shan, Ian and Katharina. Well, that was just great. And, you know, Shan, I'm looking forward to watching that finished film um, on YouTube. I believe it's on the YouTube comments and I believe it'll also be on the Orkney International Science Festival website. Excellent. And Ian and Katharina, looking at all that plastic, you know, wow, that was such a shock, the actual quantity of the stuff there. Wow, you know what? What was that like? You know when you first came there. Well, it was. Well, it was said, really. I mean, yeah. I mean, as I said, when I first walked onto that beach, um, a lot of expletives were coming out of my mouth. I just couldn't believe it. And actually, uh, another colleague of ours, Diane McLean, was was up the hill. Fil we, were, we were trying to make a film about this, and she was filming me walking down the beach. But then I took, um, I took Kathy there. Probably about a year later, I think Kathy's reaction was pretty similar. <laughs> yeah, it's un unbelievable. I mean, uh, I, I really, when Ian told me about this speech, I, I mean, I'd seen the photos, but nothing prepares you for actually standing there in the middle of the plastic in the most remote location you can imagine, surrounded by nothing but midges and um, and seeing all that plastic. It, it, I, I still, I still kind of, you know, whenever I've uh, talked about this project since then. It's um, always the point where people go very, very quiet and very pensive because I think to be confronted with the reality of that plastic pollution um, is not an easy thing. And it's not something that's the, re the everyday lived reality of most people. Most people have plastic in their lives and uh, they either use it or they, they throw it in the bin and then it's gone. Um, they're not expecting to be confronted with it in that way. So, yeah. Gosh, yes. <laughs> could you now? I've got a bit of a request before we go into the questions. Um, could you show me that reel again, please, Katerina? That was great. So you've oh, got that. Sure, yeah. You've got that with you. Fantastic. Yeah. Gosh, you've produced quite a, a lot of that. There's actually another six. Yeah. Another so six. And that oh, was nice. just from, <laughs> that was just from a handful of samples. But oh. it's uh, you know I mean you're extruding it in in a, in a very thin diameter. As you can see here, and um, I don't know a reel like that. Usually, if um, I usually use PLA um, to to three D print, and um, we did mix some PLA into this as well, which is a biodegradable plastic, so it composts um, in a hot composter and industrial composting process. It's, I think if you leave it in the just bury it in the environment, it takes more than a hundred years to to compost. But that's still better than this stuff, which which will be with us for a very very long time, and um, and. and uh, so when usually when you use the 3D printer and you print something, you get a reel like this and that will last you a very long time, maybe a year, depending on the size of objects that you print. Now, in my artistic practice, I'm a jewelry designer, so I do print on quite a small scale. If you're making larger things like people do. Uh, make functional objects for the kitchen or for the garden or for you know, for all sorts of workshop uh, purposes, then you might go through it a little bit quicker, but it, it does last a very long time. So to imagine that this is maybe, um, I think maybe 10, 10 little fragments that we granulated and re-extruded, then it's quite, it's quite shocking. But I think I see it as an opportunity as well for people to go and gather the plastic and use it and really actually make things with it. Um, and, and that's hopefully where that, you know, that that's something that can be taken away from this. I mean, without without wanting to undermine our research, I mean, it is it, it is it's a great story to show it illustrates how plastic can be potentially reused. We are in reality just hardly scratching the surface of the problem, um, given that we're talking about millions, eight million tons of plastic going into the ocean every year um so you know but but it is it's it's, a, it's got a great narrative to it 
And and that's what you have to remember as well. I mean, when you're on, on an island like that, this very remote island, there's, there's no one, you can't just pop there and pick it up in, in 10 minutes. You know, you, you can't just grab a boat and, and go out there. There's there's rocks, there's issues of accessibility, and there's the issues of the weather. Um, and it's just a tiny, tiny part of the ocean plastic problem. And as as a designer, I don't feel that this, it's a wholesale solution, but I don't feel it's my 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 place to come up with that. It's it's a narrative, as Ian says, to to raise the awareness. Right, well, thank you very much. So um, that was fascinating. We've got about. 10 minutes for questions now. So um, I'll just have a wee look at our questions that have been coming in and we'll move on to that. That's okay, excellent. Um, let's see. So we've got a few questions on uh, North Ronaldsey and North Ronaldsey sheep. And we've also got a few about plastic. So we'll start with um, a few for Shan, if that's okay. We've got a question. Um, how much yarn is produced from one fleece? Do you, do you know that, Shan? I'm afraid I don't, actually. <laughs> That'd be quite tricky, um, I guess. Yeah, I'm sorry, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh, no problem. I, I think um, I'll just say I'm also in North Ronaldsey, and I also keep North Ronaldsey sheep, so... <laughs> but um, I think, you know, a lot of it is, you know, taken out before spinning, isn't it? A lot of the hair and a lot mm -hmm. of, like, the, the dirty, mucky bits are removed, so it's probably probably less than you think is, uh, is what I would imagine there. Excellent. And another question for you, Shan, from Bill Graham. Shan, is the sheep wool more resistant than usual? Ooh, more water resistant than usual. I missed out a word there. <laughs> um, well, I think North Thornley sheep are particularly high in the lanolin content, um, which is a, is, a, is a fat, it's an oil. So um, while it's on the sheep, it definitely would be more water resistant. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, and we've got a question for Ian and Katarina. A few, a few questions here as well, um, but we've not got a time to answer everything, I'm afraid. Um, what is the most unusual object that you found on the beach of that island? Um, I'll let Ian answer that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Well, we, we found all manner of things. Um, uh, we, we found this, uh, uh, a weather boy, which was quite extraordinary, a very large weather boy there, but... Um, actually, it, what's, what's more interesting is what we've heard of from the locals. Um, I mean, you saw those pictures of Wellington boots, uh, and I'm pleased to say that there were no feet inside them, um, which is quite a, a, a ghastly kind of a, a grim thing, but that, that, that has been known from time to time, unfortunately. Um, but the, the, some of the local stories we've heard um, were back in the 1960s, uh, a chest of Chinese banknotes appeared. And there are stories of people having no, no knowledge of their value or what they were, um, people were using them to um, wallpaper their, inside of their homes. Um, and uh, uh, Donald actually told us that um, when he was a boy on the, on the island, he and his brother went down there and they found a, a chest of cigarettes. Um, and people were using actually some of these Chinese banknotes to light, this is around about the same time, to light cigarettes and light um, cigars. Um, the other thing is, is the sea beans. Um, uh, Kathy mentioned that, and I think that as soon as we heard about these, actually midwives would would collect the sea beans, and they've come from from South America, um, and and they were given to pregnant women as 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 good luck charms. And people find these things. Well, one of the uh, our, our local helpers had a collection of these, and of course, especially with Kathy being a jewelry designer, you know, we we we, we were looking at with earnest for these, but of course, <laughs> yeah. we were never going to find them. But these things are quite common. I found a set of false teeth. So oh, that yeah. was my favorite part. <laughs> yeah. uh, lots of shoes, lots of wellies, uh, lots of um, buckets and crates. But yeah, that was, yeah. Excellent. Oh, fantastic. Spirit, you know, false teeth, that's quite something to find on the beach, I have to say. <laughs> I'll be keeping an eye out on my next walk, certainly. <laughs> Okay, we've got a, a few more questions. We've got five minutes yet, so we've got a few more questions we can we can go to. We've got a question from Richard. Is this degraded form of plastic any use as 3D printer filament, which has to, has to have, excuse me, have a low impurity inclusion and be only from one form of plastic, PET, ABS, etc.? I'll let Kathy answer that. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, this is exactly what we did. That's this is three D printing filament, um, and actually, not this is made from the ocean plastic. So, as I mentioned, yes, the plastic we picked up is quite dirty. It's degraded. Um, you might have to use a larger nozzle size. So, I think the average nozzle size on a three D printer when you buy it is uh, zero point four millimeters. Um, if you start, but but now actually, a lot of people are experimenting with the larger nozzles. So, point six, point eight, anything up to one point two. Um, just to make sure that if there are any inclusions, they just um, slip right through. So yeah, it's absolutely, it, it can be used in a normal 3D printer. That's but you, you, have to, you have to be able to identify the plastic. What makes that easier, I would say, is the fact mm -hmm. that we found that most of the plastic we found was PP and HDP. Um, and sometimes you can find parts, obviously you've got the plastic marking system where you've got the little stamp on the plastic telling you what it is. You, you can see that on water bottles or coffee cups um, at the bottom if you look. Um, and there's a whole system, again, you can look that up online, what the different symbols mean. Um, but if sometimes you find a piece that has that on it, so that's very convenient. Um, yeah. yeah, a lot of rope is polypropylene and it's it's got a very distinctive smell. Yeah. When you light it, I'm sure if, if any of you have sealed the, you cut a rope and sealed the end of it with a flame, you can get that smell. Um, I, rem I remember it as a kid when my brother and I would burn our toy soldiers that were also made of polypropylene, but they, but they have that distinctive smell that you can use to identify as a burn test. I think the far greater challenge for people wanting to do this at home is um, to actually be able to granulate the plastic. Mm -hmm. When you find um, most plastics granulators are industrial machines. There are some available now for home use. They're quite pricey you can even make your own that's the um, if you want to look into that a little bit more i would suggest you look up the precious plastics website um, that has very clear instructions and build plans for plastic shredders but um you could maybe use uh, the bigger shredders you get for wood um but that is the by far the greatest challenge with this process excellent oh i see so much opportunity there for folk to you know <laughs> You can just see that on a small scale, you know, fantastic. Oh, a lot of potential there. I can, I can really see that. We've got um, time for, I think, just the one last question before we have to say goodbye, I'm afraid. Um, so we've got a final question here um, on, let's see. Well, we've got a question from Swain. Do species hitch a ride on naturally occurring materials or is this only seen as plastic drifts around the world? Oh, and I don't know, maybe Sean being a you know marine biologist has a has an answer to that um i think this was something i sort of theorized more than anything from seeing this plastic and noticing that the pp samples had no growth on them whereas the hdp samples did so i can only assume that there are some materials that encourage that more than others but uh, i haven't looked into that yet and i'm not a scientist <laughs> yeah, i'm not sure on that one either actually um yeah, I think the the large bits of plastic are certainly creating more surfaces for um, for animals to hitch a ride on. Um, but of course, you know this would happen naturally anyway, and you know bits of driftwood over time um, will bring different species to different different continents and different uh, yeah. different coastlines. I think where plastic is a little bit unique is, of course, that it degrades much slower than wood, for instance. Mm -hmm. So if you had a smallish piece of wood, I can imagine that maybe decaying before it gets anywhere near the Scottish shores. But uh, with plastic, of course, so these pieces just ever more, or they sink to the bottom of the ocean, which is not really any better. Mm. Well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much um, to all of our speakers. I think we'll just close the talk there. Well, that's been such an interesting discussion. And thank you to um, Shan Tarrant. Uh, thank you to Dr. Ian Lambert. And thank you to Dr. Katarina Vones. And Thanks thank so you to... It's an absolute pleasure to have you all. And thank you to everybody who has been participating with questions. I'm really sorry we're a little bit pushed. And thank you for everyone who asked questions. And thank you to our technical team behind the scenes, our amazing invisible technical team, with, who, without which you know, we wouldn't be able to bring this to you today. So thank you. Um, our next talk today will be at five o'clock, uh, Power from Coasts and Water. So please join us then. And let's see, let's see. Oh, of course, I've got a few things to talk about now. There are still some places available for our PD Kirk lunches this week. 
So please um, have a look online and um, find a link for those. Um, there's also space at our evening festival club table sessions as well. So if you'd like to relax around one of our virtual tables and meet some of the festival speakers, please do register to join for these events. The links can be found in the description um, for this event and um, below each PD Kirk lunch event on the festival website. Excellent. We'd also like to invite you to the festival club tonight. It's a first, first uh, club night tonight and we'll be sharing this link in the live chat now. So please save it and come along this evening. And, you know, if you are enjoying the festival, which I hope you are, please do like us on our Facebook page and follow our YouTube channel. And thank you so much again and hope to see you soon. Have a good afternoon and goodbye.